This week on Theme Park Workshop, the podcast, we're talking trackless rides, the history and evolution of them throughout Orlando and maybe beyond. Ooh, beyond. I like the sound of that. Like beyond a, a track? Well, I guess we'll find out here on Theme Park Workshop, the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Theme Park Workshop, the podcast. We are back for another week of exciting, incredible theme park discussion that goes off the rails. That's right. We're talking about trackless rides this week. So I'm here with my co-host, Adam Johnson. How are you doing this week, Adam? I'm doing great. I renewed my library card, so that's a plus. That is a plus. Yeah. That, see, here's the thing about renewing your library card and why it's a plus um, it's always the same day every two years or so, unlike Disney Plus Day. That's <laughs> apparently, that's mobile. That can change on a whim, depending on what marketing says. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that was weird because it's supposed to be Disney Plus is their birthday, but now it's not their birthday. I don't know. Disney Plus is Happy birthday. Birth- oh, you know what? It's a very merry unbirthday. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, in Alice in Wonderland, they celebrate their unbirthdays. 364, 365 on a leap year days you celebrate because it's not your birthday. It's a very merry unbirthday to you, to I you. Have, I have not enough context to understand. But... Well, Jonathan, here's what you do on Disney Plus Day. You can watch, which is not the anniversary, you can uh, <laughs> watch <laughs> Alice in Wonderland and understand why it's not great. On their not birthday. Yeah, so speaking of dark rides, Alice in Wonderland got a dark ride. It did. It was not trackless. No. No. But the rides they're talking about today, they are trackless. Yeah, so I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about the just the nature of trackless rides, what we've seen so far, how we've kind of seen them evolve, and their place both in the industry and just in attractions in general. So for all intents and purposes for this discussion, trackless ride is any ride that is not on a, the vehicle is not on a track and likely produced by Oceaneering, who has done the ride vehicle designs for most of the trackless attractions worldwide so far. And we're also including the ones that are at Universal and at Disney in Orlando in the discussion, because those are the ones that we've actually uh, experienced and can speak to. As much as I would love to talk about Mystic Manor or uh, Pooh's Honey Hunt or Aquatopia or any of those, we're just going to be talking about the Orlando ones. So, Adam, what's, what's your experience? What was your first trackless ride that you rode? Do you remember? Do I remember my first time? It might have been Skull Island Reign of Kong, the 3D. Uh, mixed media trackless dark ride that I mean I don't want to show my cards a little bit early but it's not terribly uh <laughs> well known as a trackless ride it, it it technically is it's a pretty straightforward line but yeah I think that was the first one because I think Antarctica I did later yeah yeah I didn't I wrote Skull Island before I met you and I didn't write Antarctica until I met you so right. yeah Skull Island was my first followed probably by Antarctica and then writing them that have come out basically in chronological order since then. Do you remember your first time on a trackless ride? I want to say it was probably Antarctica. I remember, I remember doing that in 2013, 2014. Um, and that was, that was the first trackless ride in Orlando. It was a really big deal. Um, it yeah. Was, it really, it was a big swing for SeaWorld just because A, you know, this was 2013, when it opened, which was coming right hot off the heels of Harry Potter had opened in 2010, kind of changed the game. And so Antarctica was SeaWorld's response to the themed land craze. They actually got to it long before Disney, who didn't come online with Pandora until 2017. But yeah, SeaWorld was like, all right, if themed lands are the thing, this is what we're going to do. And so you had, you had their themed land, which was Antarctica. They went all out. You know, the whole thing is coherently themed. It's got a nice restaurant, it's got a nice gift shop, and it's got a ride combined with an animal encounter. I and mean, there was so much excitement for it because this ride was really buried in mystery. And it, it was just also out of place for the SeaWorld chain as a whole to, to do a, a big expensive dark ride. And it's actually, it's one of those rides that I'm just fascinated with because it is such a an odd duck in 
the history of attractions and also in the history of Orlando parks and in SeaWorld where they invested in a brand new ride vehicle for this where previous track with dark rides up to this point had just moved around on the floor. And this one added a motion simulator component that was built into the actual trackless ride vehicle, which is really, it's a brilliant concept. And it's, it's one of those things that you're just like, oh yeah, that, that I th honestly think Antarctica it still has maybe my favorite ride vehicles of any attraction. They're just that versatile and that cool. I feel like if I were to ever design my own attraction, that is the ride system that I would go for. But then it opened and it received mostly positive to lukewarm reception. It was one of those where a lot of the ride, I think, worked better on paper than it did in real life. I think the biggest issue is that you had the motion-based technology and it's only really used in one scene of the ride where all the all four cars that are dispatched together just line up in front of a massive screen and just sit there and do a motion simulator sequence which <laughs> yeah. seems to defeat the purpose of having a trackless ride vehicle in my eyes i feel like to use this technology best you really have to tie it musically like make the ride vehicle feel like it's dancing or that it's like alive whereas here it's just you spin through the caves and whoa we're spinning we're doing some tilting and then you you go through the brief little storm scene and you do some more spinning in that room which just has a storm on one screen and when the ride first opened there was no dialogue for the entire first two scenes so you dispatch from the station you would see puck sliding around and then you just go around the icicle cavern room and just kind of just vibe in there for 30 seconds to 45 seconds depending on if you were the first car dispatched and you just had time to spare or if you were the last car dispatched and you had to book it and so you only got a few seconds in that room um which again yeah the pacing of the ride was so different depending on which car you got in so it was a very inconsistent experience but like the way serial designed it where each room you went through got colder and colder so that you would eventually be right next to the penguins. Um, conceptually, it's so cool. The reveal of the real penguins at the end of the ride. Problem is the song that they wrote for it that's playing is just incredibly over the top and, and, and grandiose for a picture that could often be very, very much less so. You know, you'd, you'd hear the song, it's just a world away. And then you like you hear the the epic music playing and you see a guy shoveling the penguin poop as he waves to you. <laughs> or or a penguin is actively defecating or the penguins are all asleep. I've seen all of those happen and it it just it, <laughs> it's weird. Well you're forgetting about the button of the whole experience, Jonathan. The garage door. Oh my goodness, the garage door transitions between the screens are so loud and so poorly hidden it just like you just hear the garage door go just a world away <laughs> um but then you, you move into the last scene i will admit docking and then just like right in front of you or the penguins is really cool the fact that you just yeah. step right out of your ride vehicle and you're literally just the penguins are right there it's very cool you know, there's, there's just was the room. Very, very cool. Very cold, actually. 32 degrees. Holla. Yeah, I think they just tried to do too much. There wasn't enough space. Antarctica needed more space to be a better ride and maybe more physical effects. I know we're always talking about the whole screens debate, but, you know, no practical animatronics. But that's probably because all the money went into the penguin encounter. So it's it's tough too because also the timeline is weird where you start and puck just hatches in the first pre-show and then by the end he's taking his first dive into the water so it's like you know there's time skips but that's not made clear um it, you know it was bold of sea world to tell a story with an original original character and try and get us to care about puck and kind of make him an icon like lots of good ideas it just really failed in the execution of those ideas and it's sad that SeaWorld didn't invest in maintaining Antarctica and has instead let it fall into despair to the point where now we're not even sure if it's ever going to come back. Yeah, just like the Romans. The Roman <laughs> Empire. The Antarctican Empire of the Penguin has fallen so far. 
Yeah, you could say um, it's iced over. We're, we're going back to the ice puns, but I don't have them prepared, so not that many. I think today <laughs> it's just it's just tough because the line is still there and it's often just as long because they have to pulse people through to see the penguins, so they still do the pre-show just without the ride. And it, the line for the penguins is always so long, but now there's not even a ride at the end of it. And you get a lot of guests being like, we waited an hour just to see the penguins. Like the, the problem is the ride is intrinsically connected to the habitat. You can't have people view the habitat without going through the queue or else you'd be dealing with guests fainting from cold shock. You can't just walk into it. That was the whole point of having the ride go room by room, lowering the temperature was so that that didn't happen. And so now you still have to pulse guests through, but it's a lot slower because, you know, you have to do it manually and it's like 12 guests at a time. It's, it's just kind of a disaster right now. And SeaWorld's reportedly uh, in the works trying to come up with some sort of fix. But yeah, it's it's just one of those where the, the design and everything just good in concept, execution is poor. Still one of the most beautiful attractions SeaWorld has made in terms of like rock work and um, yeah. interiors. Um, yeah, it's just such a unique mixed bag. And the fact that nobody else has used that that system until Disney did with Beauty and the Beast where yeah. they finally brought back the motion simulator on the base is interesting. Yeah. I forgot that Beauty and the Beast had a motion, uh, motion base. Yeah. I think it's the only one that's, that's followed up with that. I'm trying to think why they'd even use it. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't watched that video in a long time. So, and I think the one that I saw was like a Twitter leak. Like it was at a preview that they weren't supposed to film at. And it's like, Oh, look, it's that scene that we're all talking about. It's the thing from the Imagineering story. It's that bell. But yeah, I don't, I don't remember. But what I do remember is when uh, we went to SeaWorld for the first time, actually, we met our friends Chandler and, and Landon Kenoki. Landon's also a patron. Thank you for your contributions, Landon. <laughs> <laughs> we rode that, and for whatever reason, you had in your mind that I loved everything that was avant-garde, which may actually be true. Um, and so you're like, oh, listen, Adam, you're going to love Antarctica, uh, Empire of the Penguin uh, because of the first show scene I'm like what do you mean it's like just just watch just wait just watch and so we go into that first show scene and yeah you are just hanging out there for 45 seconds kind of like a penguin swimming on its, or uh, sliding on its belly around this ice cave um this cavern with colorful rocks and stuff i i don't know how avant-garde i would say it is <laughs> but <laughs> it doesn't really call attention to itself but it certainly is like an interesting thing these rides have in terms of pacing is there is that time to just kind of as you said dance around to have that sensation because you can't get that on any other ride really i mean jimmy neutron nick tune blast kind of did it where you use the ride vehicle to do the chicken dance yeah uh, man I, did you ever do that not to get off tangent. i did i did i did do jimmy neutron so i know what you're talking about yeah but uh not the same experience but it, it certainly is something unique that these trackless rides can do but it was strange because then in like the next room, you still spin around as the screen media plays something. But then the final room always felt so off because yeah, it has this motion base, but all of a sudden we're kind of like in a Spider-Man, Simpsons ride, Star Tours kind of experience where you're moving with the motion on the screen, but it feels not immersive at all. Yeah. Because now all of a sudden it's like, oh, we've been watching a nature documentary the whole time. Like it's on Nat Geo or something. We're using fake penguins because we didn't have the team to go out and film. <laughs> um kind of like a turtle track maybe where at the only at the end you get the real footage yeah the sea world I, staff yeah um and i guess that's true with an arc of the penguin or empire of the penguin because you wave and there's the the friendly penguin cleaner <laughs> i think there's also just kind of like this like what is our role in the story um is very abstract kind of the the location and the staff members you know what's everybody's role is yeah. not particularly clear i think you you summed it up really great with it really does feel like you're experiencing a documentary um because the characters they don't really acknowledge you're there but puck does in the little second pre-show that's kind of like the simpsons ride room he says hi to you but then yeah, by simpsons ride room you mean a pre-show that's 
kind of sequestered off and yeah in that little one where he like kind of greets you but then like the rest of the ride is very much third person especially like you know when puck jumps into the water and we follow him underwater and like like we have this third person point of view but but then the ride has narration throughout uh it didn't when it first opened but now the whole ride has kind of like a very nature doc type narrator so it, it's just it's just a unique uh unique experience yeah it certainly was never bad it was, no. it's, it was easy to clown on, certainly, but it was never like a bad ride. It just, it felt like things could have been different and like the immersivity of it. And I don't even mean immersivity like, oh, the sets are not all built and the, the, the screen media was not as AAA as it could have been. No, I just mean like, in ter- as you're saying, in terms of your role of the story here, at one point we are the penguin and then another point are we Puck or are we just like watching Puck? And it's kind of like, we were talking about Epcot, like it's dark rides are built around, like they're like essays, the video, well, essays, not video essays. That's a very <laughs> Gen Z <laughs> Zoomer kind of thing to say. No, but the, um, yeah, at Epcot, the different movies and like living with the land and Journey to Imagination, they're all there to make a point as an essay does and SeaWorld's kind of the same with Antarctica, especially because a lot of what SeaWorld and Bush do is to teach you through these experiences that are also very thrilling or are very entertaining. You know, Shikra, what does it feel like to be a Shikra bird? Well, kind of similar to how the roller coaster functions. Antarctica, let's, you know, kind of go face to face with a penguin or what's a penguin's journey through life like. So not only do you get to meet the penguins, encounter the penguins, but you can like follow a penguin. But the way they did it, as you said, is just kind of, it, it was, because it might be closed it is closed it was it was unclear but for the times where you were kind of in tune with what it was going for it was pretty fun and i mean even if, even if not it was still a fun thing to do it just it was uneven yeah. um not something that we would always wait an hour for certainly but it was different from anything sea world had just as like trackless rides are unique for any park really it just depends on how they actually utilize it as to whether that's kind of the thrill or the interest or or the gimmick as we'll talk about later on yeah uh, but antarctica i think was really the only pure trackless dark ride experience up until probably rise rise of the resistance yeah it's it's very true um so the next one we should talk about is ratatouille just because that one opened i want to say 2014 in in paris yeah yeah wow. that sounds right but it's now here you know in in 2021 I wrote I wrote it recently. Adam and I wrote it recently, and I think it was it was fine. I think it definitely does integration of practical and digital effects much better than Antarctica. Especially, uh, I know we both talked about how the little wheel beside you when you're hiding underneath the cart that's like a practical effect, and it really does it it does replicate that feeling of you being a rat it, extraordinarily well especially at ground level, like as we said, getting off, or as I said, getting off of it, I said, I feel like the tagline for this ride should be look up because most rides, they don't really want you to look up because everything is exposed. Right. Unless it's like Pirates of the Caribbean where they really paint it, you know, very dark. Because Spider-Man, you look up, you probably see a projector. On Ratatouille, you look up and you're still looking at this giant IMAX screen because of how close you are to it, like Forbidden Journey close, it feels like. Right, yeah. It's, yeah, and it's, yeah, you, you summed it up well. It's, just look up there's so much detail put into looking towards the ceiling and it puts you at that rat pov that you probably couldn't get this if you were on a spider-man continuing track yeah i really do think that like trackless was definitely the way to go for this just because it does feel like there's parts where i think you split off and you're all like running and hiding in various corners and like having all the other cars around you feels like you're a group of rats scurrying yeah. Um, I def I definitely felt that, and that was really cool because that's like, okay, the ride vehicle is adding. T- this is a feeling that I would not get if this was a track ride because it really feels like we're rats and we're all being chased. We're all scurrying, going different places, and then coming back together. So that was really really cool, and you know the media is really good. I I don't think they should have gone for such heavy swings as far as motion simulation just because it it doesn't have that yeah. aspect and i feel like that's a similar issue that mickey and minnie's runaway railway runs into with its oh yeah 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 with its soul scene um and that's that's where i feel like having the ability to do motion simulation like SeaWorld has would actually serve those rides well because i mean there's not 
there's not even really an illusion of motion just because you know those ride vehicles don't have that they're just like oh well you're gonna look like you're moving you're gonna park it for a second yeah <laughs> exactly but yeah i think ratatouille is a is a very solid application of the technology for the effect of a group of rats scurrying and I also feel like it's not as intrusive looking at the screen, like seeing the other cars next to you as Antarctica was. Yeah. Um, I also feel like that's just because Antarctica's screen was framed with like an ice border, which yeah. immediately took you out of it because it just felt like, okay, we're not we're not really here. We're watching this on a, a screen with a border. And then, of course, you look behind you and it's just the black wall with the garage doors, whereas you definitely don't. <laughs> get that on ratatouille the next ride to come online would have been skull island reign of kong yeah which is a a very interesting one because it takes the approach of we have you go on a motion base you lock into a motion base and that's how it does its motion simulation but what makes skull island unique is that it's really only a trackless ride for for the sake of having Um. (laughs) it, it really has no reason to be a trackless ride let's be real yeah, my my guess, my theory is the reason it's trackless is to give you the same sensation probably you get on the tram tour where you feel the bumps on the road. Right. More like because this was originally a tram tour uh, attraction, uh, King Kong 360 3D, to replace the old King Kong encounter, which you know inspired confrontation. But you know that history. You're listening to the show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with Skull Island, you know, and it's it's cool to see the effect of the truck just kind of ambling along and when you're actually on the ride feel the truck ambling along and yeah the single outdoor portion it's an incredible weenie and you look down it's like dude there's no track you see the tire marks or whatever you call that right which destroys the illusion of it being fresh a little bit because they make no effort i mean it's probably very expensive to try to maybe not paint it over but like cover it up and who yeah. knows what kind of difficulties that would introduce uh but still i I don't know if you really get that on other motion-based attractions that aren't that do have a track. Like I don't know if like Spider-Man or Transform Transformers is probably the closest example in terms of like the kind of shakiness. Yeah, it feels um, maybe more controlled on Transformers than it would on Skull Island because Skull Island, while it has its path, it's really just kind of ambling along on it, whereas okay. everything feels controlled on something like our um, Spidey or Transformers. Yeah, I know. I would agree that, you know, I would, I would agree that just having the tires on the ground and the ride vehicle moving, you know, being relying on the tires and having the bumpier path definitely adds a lot to the feeling of it in a way that it probably wouldn't have if it was on a a bar. You'd probably have to have a lot flatter surface, I'd imagine. But it also, you wouldn't be able to realistically pull those tight turns unless you did a lot of effects animation on the wheels because the actual ride vehicles are four-wheel drive which is you know and the wheels are obviously controlled by the trackless system so it's really just like giant remote control cars but it definitely feels more real because you have that tension between the wheel and the ground and you can have those terrain shifts yeah Um, i just just thought of a better example than transformers and spider-man because they're obviously obviously very different systems uh earthquake earthquake would probably be the best because that's that was on a track you move forward into the showroom you move back into the loading area but that never felt particularly real yeah. <laughs> on its motion base i guess when we really knew it was disaster but all the same whereas kong you feel it kind of lock in on its motion base in the final show scene especially in its um spiritual successor <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but yeah it still feels it still feels like a natural movement more so than everything feels controlled because the whole thing kind of rattles on its own as opposed to it's locked into a track and it's big that's yeah. my sound of shaking whereas earthquake was like very rhythmic whereas kong's like I you think that's the feel, best way to describe it in audio. Yeah, you can feel the Jeep bounce on its shock absorbers as you go around, and I think that that helps. But it, I think in the same way as Ratatouille, it also tries to pull off certain motion simulation bits that it can't quite do. I think the the biggest one that comes to mind is when Kong catches you from the fall. Oh, yeah. I think that like when he's putting the vehicle down on the ground and you just kind of like see it's like, oh, the motion simulation can't quite sell that. 
No, well, I think if they had the front screen, that would help matters. But no, definitely, it's not. It's not very intense movement, and you kind of need intense movement to really sell that. I mean, there's no seatbelts on this, so yes, can only do so much. I would argue that the best moment of motion simulation, maybe in the entire resort, is in that scene though, which is when you first fall off the edge of the cliff and you're hanging on the vines and you swing towards the T-Rex and then you swing back towards Kong. That motion simulation is perfect to make that scene feel 100% real and then combined with the T-Rex spit as he chomps at you and then swinging back over to Kong and the music. And the wind effects too. Yeah, just that whole scene. I honestly, I would say that that is maybe the most immersive scene at the resort. Like everything about that just fits really perfectly the only other one i think really comes close to it is the 40 foot well i don't know if it's 40 feet but the multi-story drop the 20 story drop on spider-man yeah it's the first time you do it yeah i I would agree with that yeah i still don't know how they really cool it off so well so but do you think i mean i know we kind of alluded to it at the beginning of this little segment but with skull island rana kong being trackless do you think the very linear path that this attraction takes i know we talked about it being a plus in the first show scene but for the following show scenes do you really think it's effective as a trackless one i would say not particularly um i really do think what the ride system does with this you really open my eyes with just the whole the wheels are on the ground and so it actually feels like a real vehicle because it is a real vehicle it's basically just like a remote controlled real vehicle as opposed to something masquerading as a vehicle that's just sliding along a bar and it also allows them to do like when you get stuck in the mud with the worms in that scene that's also a motion base and it just feels more real because then you have the shock absorbers on the vehicle interacting with the motion base so it feels less robotic i feel like do you really need it for the kong scene no do you really need it for the first scene where you're meeting Kate? Not particularly, but I really do think that you you could have pulled this ride off with a track, but I do think it would be a lesser ride for it. I think seeing seeing like the the bar that the ride is on and the outside portion would feel cheap. I feel like um, you definitely wouldn't it wouldn't feel as real. I think that just speaks a lot to Kong's execution of what could have very well been a more mediocre attraction that had stellar execution from the music to the additional story and how that was thought out and like even just having that little bypass at the start so that it can operate in the rain um congress has a lot of really nice touches oh and of course the animatronic drivers like that was so oh yeah extra you could have you could have done that with the screen you could have cheaped out but the fact that they built five different animatronic drivers, like that is, it, honestly, it's it's a testament to the, the thought and the effort that went into the attraction. Yeah, between that and most of the motion and that trackless feeling that I'm assuming you can only get on the trackless vehicle, at least based on my experience with tracked vehicles, it really sells that expedition experience, that Jeep experience. More yeah. so than, you wanna move on? Fast and Furious, supercharged. Oh my goodness. If, if there's a ride that has needed the trackless technology less, I do not know it. It's what a there's miss. not that many out there. So yeah, I would say this is the least deserving. Um, what a fired. application of funding for an attraction that there is no very, like at least with Kong, if you were just arguing on, we don't want to have to build a switch track we make it trackless like okay there's two different ride paths i get it this does not even have that excuse you literally could put this on a track and it would make no difference none at all (laughs) yeah this is a purely practical application and by practical i mean like in terms of you're planning around the park you're using a lot of used assets so like skull island reign of kong it's a spinoff of a Universal Studios Hollywood studio tour scene, sequence, attraction, which was also Fast and Furious Supercharged, the finale of the whole tour. Way to go, guys. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So 
you're like, okay, well, it's going to be based on the studio tour. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, what else is based on the studio tour? Uh, Skull and Rain of Khan. We can just use the same trackless technology because it's the same spin. It's the same thing that, that, that it's spun off of. We can have that studio tour kind of replication without needing a driver, like a real life driver. But as in terms of a concept for guests, and, and you know, actually they, they did get away with it too with Spider-Man and Transformers. You have Islands of Adventures application of the technology, and then you have studios application of that technology right so it's still kind of same there's precedent there's a lot of precedent for fast and furious supercharged to be the way that it is between the studio tour between the parks uh or the resorts philosophy as as far as the relationship between the two parks to give the same experience the unique attractions uh but when you go in for a standalone fast and furious drive this is not what you want no yeah but we've talked about this before, that having that large ride vehicle does kind of allow that whole idea of Fast and Furious being about family. Because what's a family? It's a lot of people. So in a way, you get to experience with one, your family, but also all these other people who are joining your family and, and these other guests. How are you going to pack all of these sardines together? Well, you can't do it in a test track type vehicle. You really won't feel like it in a roller coaster because of how sequestered those seats could be I mean, you don't really feel on spider-man spider-man transformers fallon well not fallon uh but spider-man transformers simpsons those really feel like just maybe your row <laughs> yeah. depends on what kind of conversation you have with people next to you with how tightly packed kong and fast and furious are you need you know you you definitely like feel like you're with 48 people or something like that however many people fit on that car so from a story perspective, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. You really feel like a family or at least but you have the shared trauma of experiencing this ride when you're experiencing it with 47 <laughs> friends. So I can, I can understand that. But in terms of the experience itself, the thrill itself, if you can call it that, it is it, it actively hurts enjoyment of the ride because what is it, it's to get from one showroom to the next you try so hard to sell this thing of traveling a long distance through a dark tunnel by having the wall map technology yeah it's like oh you can only really do that with a trackless drive to sell it okay maybe but but did we have does that actually like actively help anything or is that to distract us from the fact that we're watching another video of the rock <laughs> another it's disguising another pre-show but it is, it is, the, that is, to be fair, that is the best effect in the ride. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. But, I mean, maybe it, isn't uh, Mario Kart using that same kind of idea? It is, for, I think, yeah. the Rainbow Road scene, which is, oh, man, it's, I can't wait for us to get Mario Kart here. That's going to be so cool to see. Yeah, to go on a tangent, are you going to go to Hollywood to see it open? Or are you going to wait till it comes here? I'm not sure. It'll really depend on, I think, where I'm at financially at the time. And yeah. uh, I honestly, I, I think if if tourism opens in Japan, I'd rather go to to theirs first before California. Just I feel like even cost wise, it's not going to be that much more to do Japan th than it would be to do California at this point. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but just for like a day or two in Japan, do their whole Super Nintendo, see the, the Yoshi attraction and the I don't know when their Donkey Kong attraction is opening, but yeah, I don't know. it would be cool to, and then they have their whole Jurassic Park section with the flying dinosaur coaster oh, and true. Um, Hollywood Dream. It would just be cool. They have a lot of unique takes on, uh, they, and they still have Jaws. So Oh yeah, I forgot. I hope you uh, have your old script with you so you can follow along, unless you're yeah. going to download Duolingo and learn Japanese. <laughs> I might do that. <laughs> Whereas, uh, Hollywood, it's like, what do they have in Hollywood? They got Secret Life of Pets and yeah. Jurassic World The Ride. I think I'd rather do Japan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they have Waterworld too. That's right. Oh, yeah, Waterworld, Waterworld. Waterworld. But I think Japan has Waterworld too. So, yeah, but what Hollywood has apparently learned based on some headlines I've seen is that they're realizing Supercharge is not the best way to go about a Fast and Furious attraction. And so the rumor is that they might be building a roller coaster based on Fast and Furious. Yeah. If Which, only Florida could learn. If anything, it'll come. Like, I don't anticipate Fast and Furious Supercharge making it into the 2030s. Um, oh, no. That I, would be that would be really sad if it did. 
I, like, I, and it's so funny because people talk like, oh, Men in Black is going to be the next thing to go. I'm like, no, no, no. Men in Black is not anywhere close to being on the chopping block. We're going to see Fear Factor, Simpsons, and or uh, Fast and Furious Supercharged, I think, all kick the bucket before Men in Black does. Yeah, the only way I see Men in Black leaving is if some intern really drops the Like the intern that forgot to uh, submit Solo a Star Wars story for Best Original Music at the Oscars. <laughs> yeah. Best Star Wars score not even nominated because of that. The only way I can imagine is if uh, they moved on to Universal Studios Florida and forgot to resubmit the application for the rights for the ride to exist. Yeah. <laughs> to use that IP. <laughs> That's not going to happen, right? No, right? no. Fast and Furious Supercharged would definitely go first because when the main show experience of that is driving in a straight line, when you're not really being shaken around too much, like nothing in the ride is really shaking you, you're just being blasted. Most of the um, effects come from the fog and the unexplained water. Why is it trackless, Jonathan? Tell me. Tell me, please. I don't know. But I think if you're talking about chopping block, I think Kid Zone is probably oh true up there as well, especially when you look at just what parts of the park haven't been changed. But moving As on. a proud owner of the E.T. book with the Green Planet, I must say, um, save E.T. Save <laughs> E.T. It's not going anywhere. Spiel- Spielberg has his hand on it. Uh, and it's it's source of too many great memes. But then after all this, you know, uh, uh, there was a rumor that Secret Life of Pets was originally supposed to be trackless, but apparently all the technical issues with Kong and Fast and Furious have dissuaded Universal from using trackless technology in the future, which is also why uh, Mario Kart is a bus bar ride. The Universal Monsters attractions, you know, just rumored to be an upgraded Forbidden Journey. And uh, I don't think Dragons or Potter have any trackless as well. Which, you know, would be, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. It's like, oh, we're building a brand new state-of-the-art park, but there's nothing trackless in it. It's kind of a surprising thing, to be honest. But it really just, they're not willing to to deal with the technical issues. Do you think that the trackless rides are worth the technical issues that they bring? Because I think we all know the issues Rise the Resistance has had. Mickey and Minnie certainly hasn't been perfect. Antarctica is where it is now. Uh, Fast and Furious was not the most reliable. What Do you, do you think that the downtime is worth the effect that the trackless systems can have. I know we haven't talked about these last two yet, and one of them is one of your all-time favorites, but what do you think? I think I think we're batting 50-50 here in the States when it comes to trackless meaning something. Like, yeah. for Skull Island and Fast and Furious to be experiencing the issues that they do, and especially the load times that they do, I'm assuming due to the trackless technology, I could be wrong there. Um, Jonathan, you're, you're more knowledgeable on that to me. Is that downtime because of the ride vehicle? Uh, I think so. Yeah. It's not totally worth it because you don't, I mean, we talked about, you kind of feel it on Kong, but Kong could have just as well been, as you say, a bus bar attraction. Yeah. Antarctica, I think was, I think Antarctica was probably worth it because it was unique for SeaWorld. It helped differentiate them in some way. It unfortunately didn't take off, I think, the way they wanted it to. Yeah. Um, as far as wait times go and attendance, the coasters have definitely been helping them out more in that regard. But again, it was also the only kids ride you really had there besides Wild Arctic and uh, Sesame Street. So it was just wrong place, wrong time, I think, for Antarctica. Yeah. I think, though, for the Disney attractions... Ratatouille didn't need to be trackless, I don't think. I mean, it has some perks to it, but uh, Hollywood Studios trackless rides, I think, kind of needed to be trackless to yeah. have the experiences that they do. If we're counting internationally, I don't know every single trackless dark ride there is in existence, but just based on videos, it definitely feels like Mystic Manor, or looks like Mystic Manor, kind of is the lodestar for trackless and how you really do split off a lot and you have unique ride experiences i think that's really the potential for a trackless ride is to have unique experiences every ride and in a way that feels more natural maybe than say star tours you have a random assignment of like three or four scenes or skull and reign of kong oh boy i hope i don't get becky this time i hope i get kalana or, or jinx yeah i'm putting my brother on that one he he's gotten becky too many times to enjoy the ride <laughs> um when it's used to its its max you really feel like you're seeing something another car's not and you're having a different experience of that 
that ride, whether it is the timing or whether it is actually purposeful. Uh, like Hotel Transylvania over in Dubai, I think. Yeah. I don't think it needed to be trackless if I remember that one ride because it's a lot of downtime that yeah. you kind of get away with by having like, oh, well, it's kind of a, it's kind of dancing around or it's not connected to anything. So you can kind of just hang out. Well, that, that doesn't exactly work. Whereas like Mickey and Minnie, when you have your quote hangout scene with the, the waterfall yeah. effect, that's to hide a transition in the previous room and to kind of tie into it. So that, that one room can serve two purposes. Right. Um, but you're still being stimulated. Whereas when used poorly, you're just kind of sitting around for a little while, but, oh, but it's trackless. Woo. Yeah. So at least in the States though, half and half, there's definitely room for improvement. And I hope the parks are looking to it because every time I've been on a trackless ride, I'm like, man, I love the dancing feeling. I love the gliding feeling. Yeah. You don't have, you don't, if the ride shuts down, like if they have to do an e-stop, you don't feel like the brakes grinding to a halt. I remember getting stuck on Spider-Man and we ended up stuck in a diagonal position as you just hear like the brakes just grinding on that 20 year old rail or something. It's like, yeah, ah! I don't, I've not been stuck on a trackless ride, but I, I, I'm assuming it's not as violent. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Um, because it feels so smooth. Uh, you bring up an interesting point about kind of Star Tours and the randomization aspect that the trackless rides that we've seen really haven't leaned into the randomization or the uniqueness that each ride can bring. Like there's no, uh, when you have a, when you have a trackless ride and like the groups of vehicles, like you could theoretically send each of the four ride vehicles that are off together into a different scene before like, and like say the waterfall scene in Mickey and Minnie's, that could have been a different scene for each car which would might have encouraged rerides but that's not really something that i don't think any of the attractions have taken advantage of the ability to provide unique or, or different scenes per ride vehicle that trackless offers which is an, an interesting point yeah i think mickey and minnie and rise of the resistance have their their ways of doing that um with mickey and minnie you might see the beginning of a scene that another car might not and if you're at the back car you get to see how a scene ends whereas everyone else is like oh that's cool well I'll just keep on going my way and there's like nice little buttons there and yeah. rise of the resistance you've got oh i'm gonna face uh, a probe droid or i'm not gonna face a probe droid i'm gonna face an at -AT. i'm gonna face a blaster right definitely trade-offs there but they're unique that is that is that is fair especially i think yeah the rise of the resistance the facing off with the walker versus the stormtrooper is a very notable difference but yeah, so next, of course, we have uh, Rise of the Resistance, which, you know, hailed as one of the greatest dark rides of our time. It's my favorite at Hollywood Studios. And I know- It's definitely the most uh, techn technolo technologically ambitious, technically ambitious one yeah. ever. Um, it deserves every praise it gets. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of people talked about how Rise of the Resistance really does follow a linear a more linear story than most other trackless rides. Well, I guess not compared to Fast and Furious or Kong, but like as far as like having those eight person ride vehicles that are kind of the trackless standard, like for the most part, the there isn't a lot of vehicle dancing. I will say there's there's like the part where you're supposed to go, you know, in the big AT, -AT room, you're aiming for that exit, the doors close, then you have to backtrack. Yeah. But overall, for the most part, you're going in straight lines. Well, actually, I mean, yeah, yeah, you kind of are, but they do use like, there's like the gun scene where the guns are shooting and they block your path. And so it really feels like you're kind of just freely moving in that way. I would say though, that Rise of the Resistance, one, it maxes out the potential and two, the potential of this kind of ride. And two, it makes it even more immersive Yes. than any other Star Wars ride could be. Yeah. I don't just mean that, like, oh, on Star Tours, we're looking at screens, doo doo No, I, I mean, like, if you're going to feel immersed in Star Wars, it's in the way Rise of the Resistance does, because it's harder to see the holes in the technology. So with Rise, and maybe, let's start with Max and the Potential out, there's, like, what, three different ride systems going on here? Right. You got your normal dark ride, trackless dark ride tech, you've got drop tower tech, and you've got motion-based tech. Yeah. In, in the drop tower you can only have that versatility in this way unless you're actively moving to a new ride vehicle the way you do on that pacific rim ride that is open um over the over the i think it's in japan something like that or singapore 
like but you actually you have to get up do a walkthrough and then sit down yeah. um actually if you if you count the whole walkthrough portion that is the the queue and stuff i mean that's an attraction all in itself but it's kind of different but the having the trackless allows you to hide the holes and like resetting the other vehicles the next group's vehicles because yeah. it's part of the story it's like oh those are actually the bad vehicles or the bad droids guiding those vehicles so i guess now we're kind of getting into the immersivity but that's because of the max potential you're right yeah. it does it does use its opportunities provided by the trackless ride technology for the story um which is really really cool yeah so how is you going to be able to experience an escape pod moment which is like one of the pivotal moments of star wars movie it's how luke's story started because the droids pop up on the escape pod let's give guests that experience all right drop tower um but you also don't need to feel like you're flying i mean you can do that million falcon but i mean this is the star wars right let's do flying and so in that same drop tower shaft your vehicle is able to move i right think the only the thing that could have put it over the edge is if as you said your main ride vehicle has that antarctica kind of right thing, which it doesn't but you almost don't care because there's plenty of well enough trade-offs oh yeah i think I think, yeah, what you're saying is if, if they had gone with the SeaWorld ride tech, I think it would have been a harder sell just as an escape vehicle, just because yeah. of the little kind of gap that you need to have for that motion base. Like the Antarctica ride vehicles are substantially larger than the Rise vehicles. Um, so I feel like you wouldn't have been able to do as as quick of navigation and also as fast. I feel like the Antarctica ride vehicles are also slower because they have more, they're a lot heavier than the Rise vehicles. Yeah, so I think that was fine. And then just doing the motion simulator section for the the drop works. I mean, and that's the strategy that Universal has used as well on uh, Gringotts is, you know, it's coaster, but then there's two sections of the ride where they wanted motion simulation. And so they, you know, have the motion simulation track that allows them to do that. And then it moves on. And as part of the trackless technology, you get to have like the droid be a character through your ride vehicle like that part where you're in the elevator shaft and Kylo starts cutting through your your ceiling, the droid yeah. reacts. And it also works as like sh um, showmanship because you back up because the droid's scared at Kylo Ren about to annihilate everyone in that room. But also as, a, you know, in terms of stagecraft, you just he's like, hey, look, effect. And you're like, whoa, effect. And then you get into the next room, your mind is blown because there's these trackless uh, vehicles which are actually props, prop cannons, blowing off into the screen on our side. Yeah. And you get to do that, you know, shuffle dance. Yeah. Which, if you had, like, multiple tracks going on there, that's a liability waiting to happen. Yeah. Probably. It's very true. So the last ride on our list, uh, and the most recent track was Ride in Orlando, if you don't count Ratatouille, is Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. And this is your favorite, so I'll go ahead and let you intro this one. Yeah, it is. As as like diehard theme park fans and itching for every little bit of information that we can get before an attraction opens. And for me, that even counts to POVs. Like I'm so used to watching POVs before I go to experience a new attraction that I've already spoiled it for myself. So when I go, I'm like, oh, recognizing all the stuff. So I didn't have this particular experience. For me, it was just fun and cool. But when my brother and his girlfriend went on this uh, ride, oh, I want to say probably in January, last January, something like that, he told he told his girlfriend, don't worry, it's like the great movie ride. You're just literally in a slow moving car because that's how it looks at first. It looks like a great movie ride car. And then as part of the ride, you know, ride story, Mickey, oh no, the track switch. And the track switch happens, everything goes crazy because your vehicle has literally fallen apart from itself. And so you're able to have kind of that same gliding motion through all these scenes with, with your characters. And to me, having it trackless really kind of encourages that zany feel of the Paul Rudish Mickey shorts, where everything is chaotic, everything is at an 11, but it also, you know, having the light feeling, the, the not very intense thrill of a trackless, you're able to have pretty much the maximum number of guests be able to experience it you know there's not a whole lot restricting people from going on this ride while also kind of having that chaotic feel you have the dancing scene with daisy which 
is one of the things that we love about trackless rides is you get to have your quote unquote dancing gliding moments mm-hmm. as terms in terms of storytelling and having these different experiences it can be a bit hard to follow but i mean in a way so are the paul rouge mickey shorts because so much is happening in five minutes more so the old school ones than like the wonderful world with mickey mouse ones um the way it's telling a story yeah you get to see as i mentioned earlier you get to see the beginnings of scenes or the ends of scenes or the middles of scenes and you get to you know kind of move around in different ways and reactions to what's going on on the screen based on which vehicle you're in so to me that encourages rewrites for other people it's like well yes this car is definitely the worst car because you're seeing this and not that but i mean we also people are, are judging seats on velocicoaster because apparently that's got a different experience in every single seat one is probably gonna be better than the other sure the boba fett scene might be cooler than the kylo ren scene i get it, on, on star tours <laughs> but i think that just kind of encourages the rewrites on this which you need i think for a marquee ride and in a ride that's probably more accessible than say rise of the resistance in the same park i i yeah i love this ride i love it for what it does for the characters i love it for just how fun and exciting it is and that's that's both in like what the vehicle does and what the media does the giant room sized screens or projection technology i actually don't know which one it is either way though it's it's pretty cool but um i mean as far as like using a trackless system jonathan like do you kind of feel that chaos? Do you kind of feel the zany or to you, could this have been any old ride? I think there's scenes in the ride that use it. I think it's not, it's not really enough to it to, in the way that, and I know we haven't discussed it, but like in the way that Mystic Manor uh, or Pooh's Honey Hunt do, where there is just that, you know, certain scenes are just so positively impacted by, the ride system um and in a way like like the daisy dance studio scene it it's one of those scenes that doesn't really fit into the narrative all that well it more so just exists to be a fun trackless scene and just to have a big open room for you to actually do stuff but for the most part of the ride your vehicles stay pretty linear overall um, yeah. there's, there's some switch ups but and then you also have the the cool thing that people don't talk about which is where you know you lose goofy at the start of the ride and then he's back at the end of the ride and that's only possible because of the trackless technology which i think is a really cool story thing where oh the engine's back at the end because they were able to he was able to go another way and then just mysteriously reappear not realizing that he lost everyone for about four minutes (laughs) exactly so like story-wise i think i think it certainly justifies it and i think the conga scene is fun yeah. I mean, it is a runaway railway. How else are you really going to do that? Uh, yeah, I just think particularly with the final scene of switching up, we are going through the factory and then the, the lever gets pulled and it switches into a park. I've never felt that that scene was done serviced by the trackless system just because of the way it plays out. It's like so small. And if like, I feel like the threat of the chomper that that scene is based on, which is like you're, the whole idea is the cars are moving closer to the smasher and that needs to be stopped because of the way that's presented not as something physical but just kind of on a screen and like the back car coming in can hardly see it because it's so far away yeah um i don't think that scene is readable to everybody because the ride is trackless that is true i was Um, poo-pooing poo-pooers but yeah the first time i rode that i didn't even get the tension in that scene i was able to acknowledge the first version of that room before the second one was already showing up Right. So I couldn't um, even notice the change, even though everything had changed because I didn't get to see what it was the first time. Yeah. And so I think there are certainly aspects of it that are served well by the trackless system, but I I don't think it's the best execution of that system. I think it's very fun. It's exciting. It just doesn't go that extra mile to really make, to really build a ride around trackless technology. Yeah. Which, have, have you seen the ride video for Mystic Manor? Do you know oh, yeah, how, yeah. how that ride ends? Where, like, the, the cars are kind of throughout the Mystic Manor. Like, they'll do different things. Like, one of them will go close to, like, an arrow, and it'll shoot the arrow while another one's over doing something else. And there's, like, enough stuff for the cars to do. But when it all comes together at the end for that last scene, the whole idea is that the music box has gone out of control and the whole room is falling apart. Uh, and you're all swirling around the monkey statue in the middle as it's like this this storm of magic and the combination of the vehicle with the visuals and what's happening on the screens and the practical effects with it like with the screen actually or the wall literally popping out 
Right, yeah. The, to reveal the screen. Another screen underneath. And then, of course, going moving from that into a replication of the first room where you have fiber optics creating all the magic. And then when the music box finally gets closed and the lights come up and you're all in the kind of the same position. I just feel like Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway's finale just isn't the same as no. that. Uh, well, there's even the tornado scene in Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway where you just kind of go past the tornado, I think. I don't think you really spin around. No. You're assaulted with wind. Hold on to your hats, folks, because you're going to lose it in that scene if you're not careful. But you don't really spin around it. You don't. Your vehicle doesn't go around the way it does the monkey uh, statue or the monkey itself right. in, in Mystic Manor. It's it's really just like, a, oh, okay, cool. Oh, the wind, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as we've said before, like every attraction here could have done more to meet that load star. I mean, maybe right, I'll give Rise a pass just because it does so much else that it doesn't need the circle around scene. Yeah. Because it's doing literally everything else that you could do. Antarctica has the circle around in the ice cavern, kind of. It does. But it's not the same awe-inspiring. It's not a climax. It's not a, it's climax kind of as a dud because of the screen. Right. And the laughable over dramaticness of that number to reveal <laughs> an opening garage door and a sleeping penguin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we still have a lot more to experience with trackless rides, but where we have come so far definitely excites me. Um, and I hope, I hope we get, well, actually, I take that back. I was gonna say, I hope we get more trackless than Omni Movers, but I think. Because that's what Disney used to do. They used to do an Omni Mover for a lot of things. You go to Fantasyland and you're experiencing an Omni Mover or something close to it yeah. um, everywhere you go, except for Small World or Seven Dwarfs. Um, if everything was a trackless ride experience, it would get old fast. Same way 3D screens got old fast at Universal. Yeah. So I think, it, however, you know, parks evolve, having used tr uh, trackless the way they have, I hope we still have that variation and spontaneity so if that means you know yanking skull island and fast and furious out even though i love skull island but to have an updated ride vehicle experience that better use utilizes that technology and i don't think universal is probably going to pursue this more just because of their experiences with it as you said yeah um then i'm all for it because to me trackless kind of is the it represents a, uh, an exciting future for immersivity. Immersivity uh, represents an um, exciting vision of of what a normal dark ride could be that maybe doesn't go all the way in terms of you know assaulting your senses. Yeah. Um, but I mean, imagine how Little Mermaid uh, undersea voyage could have been, or undersea journey uh, could have been had it been more like this as opposed to just another omni mover clamshell experience in the magic kingdom yeah that's yeah that's a really good point i would even want to go back to uh i mean that was a really good closer but i did want to go back to oh yeah please go back run a yeah. runaway railway like when you're talking about the tornado scene like the last car to make it through that scene doesn't even get to see the first of that big room before it changes yeah because you have the first car that goes past the tornado it has to go all the way down to the last one but by the time that last car gets in it's like you just go straight into the waterfall scene that's true yeah um and you kind of miss that effect um which is just kind of one of those where it's just like i don't think the the design of the scenes fully serves the trackless ride but it is still an absolute blast and i love the music and the i love the fact that there are so many animatronics um like you do have the mickey and minnie you do have the pluto you do have the daisy um like they, it's definitely it's not it's not a slouch of a ride. It is oh, no, not at all. It is certainly, uh, certainly very good. But for me, I know we didn't talk about it. I think Mystic Manor still is probably the best track with Stark ride up to this point. There just is can't wait to experience it someday. <laughs> yeah, there is one other track with I'm just realizing that we didn't talk about. Um, oh, just because this is, uh, relatively forgotten about. But when California Adventure opened. Uh, or the the redo with Cars Land, um, there was Luigi's Flying Tires, which did not work. Oh yeah, and they actually replaced that with um, I want to say it's Luigi's Tire Dance or something, and it's just uh, you can do a quick Google search on this if you haven't seen it. It's basically literally just 
trackless ride vehicles dancing in an open square. And Luigi's Rock and Roadsters. That's what it's, what it's called. called. This feels like exactly what Aliens Throwing Saucers probably wants to be. Yeah. But it would have been too expensive to do this, probably. Yeah. But yeah, Luigi's Rollick and Roadsters really is just the base. We're using the trackless ride vehicles to do a fun dance ride, and it looks cool. And you have such high capacity because there are so many vehicles all at once. It kind of reminds me of like a bumper cars, but where you don't control them. Like everybody goes out into the cars and then, then they do a dance. And it's a lot of fun. It's a really like very simple but useful application of the technology, similar to Aquatopia. And then somehow we completely forgot about this, but the Tower of Terror. I guess yeah, the original, uh, trackless ride in Florida. So we apologize to Disney and to Tower of Terror stands. Don't come at us. Um, but if you but, do come at us, please leave a comment. Um, <laughs> it does it does help with the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so Tower of Terror. Uh, I'd I'd say that's a great application of trackless technology yeah. for. That scene also for the load and unload, allowing load and unload in different places um, w while not needing the extra space that a, a bus bar attraction would require to do load and unload in separate places. That's right. It also kind of gives it its own eeriness because you go in expecting, oh, we're just going to go up and down because that's what I saw outside. I saw right. the elevator or the window open up and oh shoot, there's people screaming because they're falling down a drop tower. That's all this is, right? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we like to call the Twilight Zone fam. And so that means you're going to go up, you're going to go down, but you're also going to go side to side. And every time that uh, I go on it, I'm always unnerved. Not by the fact that we're moving, although that isn't unnerving. It's that it also has to lock down into the shaft and do all the things it does. I didn't watch behind the attraction, so I don't know the technology. Um, like most people, I did not watch the Disney Plus show. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but as it takes the time to just make sure that everything's locked down and Rod Serling sound alike, you know, it takes a bit for that track to actually start. Or And there's just like that, pardon my pun, dead space, dead air, just like, in this very warm shaft and you're afraid of what's going to happen next because this this vehicle is trackless it's moving on its own who knows what can happen next who knows what can ah because you've now fallen yeah or shot up yeah i think it's yeah it's it's a great application of the technology it allows for that surprise and um as the original uh, I think you couldn't really have a better first track with Stark Ride to start out. No, no, you couldn't. Um, and if we're looking at this, because we've kind of been looking at this as like an evolution of the track with Stark Ride in Orlando. Um, I mean, discounting Luigi and our offhand references to Mystic Manor. But <laughs> whereas Luigi took an aspect that people love about the track with Ride, which is the dancing, Tower of Terror was really the groundwork for where this could go next on Rise of the Resistance, what, 20 years later? I think, yeah, around 20 years later, it opened in yeah. 19. Tower of Terror, I think, was 99. So, yeah, 20 years later, not only do you get the, we move around and just to get to in a drop shaft and, and fall for a little bit, Rise of the Resistance would then go on and make just the most immersive, practical, dark ride ever, while also having a motion pace at the end of a freaking drop tower. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's not connected to a, at least your car isn't connected to that wire necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. So that concludes our, our analysis of the trackless dark rides. Let us know in the comments what your favorite trackless ride is and how, how would you like to see the trackless technology used in the future? Do you want to go for more of the uh, narrative ones or do you want it to kind of be used as like a, a trick, kind of like Tower of Terror? Or um, do you think that like there should just all dark rides should be trackless? Trackless track dark rides are are part of the past that no longer need to exist. Um, or did Walt Disney perfect this technology in what, 1959 with the Omnimover? And this is all, all just meaningless. Yeah. Let us know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, be sure to like and rate the show and we will see you for a very, very special episode of Theme Park Workshop, the podcast. And all I have to say now, penguins. Penguins.
This episode has been produced and edited by Adam Johnson and has been co-created and co-hosted by Jonathan Edward. Special thanks to our patron, Landon Kanoki. If you want to follow us on Twitter, follow us at WorkshopTP. Follow Adam at AdamJ underscore film and Jonathan at Wesley as you wish. And heck, try the Instagram as well at Theme Park Workshop. Stay tuned for a very special season two finale. Well, it might be out right now. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hey.